a Debian developer for over a decade and has led the development of Debian's current installer as well as developing Deb Helper and Deb Conf. His current goal is to expand the use of version control systems beyond source control, which has led to the git back wiki wiki wiki, etc. keeper to store slash etc. in git, and git annex to manage big data with git. He is currently funded by Kickstarter to develop git annex into something resembling a distributed git back dropbox. Over to you, Joey. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and um, apologies for the delay, and apologies to anybody who's watching the recording that we uh, only have video of the screen behind me and not direct output. There were technical issues. So um, I'm going to be talking about two different things today and giving two demos. So if I start going too fast, please let me know. Um, so the first thing is Git Annex, which is basically building on Git. And then I'm going to speak about something that takes the Git Annex base that I developed and build something completely different on top of that. So um, I have to start with a little story. About um, three or four years ago, I moved out to a fairly remote location out in the country, and I only had internet access through one of these things, dial-up. And I'm actually still on dial-up, and when I moved out there, after about a week of living out there, I realized that I spent a lot of time with these kind of things. And I was, you know, downloading them to remote computers, and when I was back in town on fast internet, you know, sneakernetting them around, and it got really annoying pretty quick. Um, and at the same time, I was interested in learning this Haskell language. So actually, I was also downloading lots of Haskell talks and reading about it and so on. I really was looking for some simple program that I could write in Haskell, because you have to start with something simple, but you have to start with something real. And this isn't really going to be a talk about Haskell. But this Git Annex is written in it, so I thought I'll let you know. So, Git is awesome, like Josh said yesterday. Um, it's just a beautiful system. You know, we have these beautiful trees. We make wonderful things. We have some dead projects along the way, but in general, it's perfect for everybody in this room, I'm sure, right? But you know, if you're giving talks here at LCA, you've probably seen this. It's the uh, open office version control system as it is. Maybe you haven't seen it because you probably didn't use it to version control your documents. But if a regular user is uh, trying to work on a presentation, they're probably either going to use this or wish that they had. Because otherwise, they'll probably run into this. <laughs> and uh, I saw this many times after I'd shut down the program cleanly. But anyway, um, <laughs> what I wonder is why do, they ha why do users have to worry, oh no, I'm about to lose all the work that I put in my slides the night before the talk, right? And of course, there's really good reasons why regular average Joe user out on the street or in the boardroom or whatever isn't using Git, right? It's hard to use, but there's, te there's good technical reasons too besides just, you know, I mean, if it's hard to use, the open office guys can surely add it in somehow as a back end. But they also have technical issues. They're saving compiles in a compressed zip format. That means that every time they click on, a user clicks on save, it's going to dump out a new file. Um, in my case, it would probably be a new 7 megabyte or 10 megabyte file or something for their presentation. And that doesn't Delta compress. So it's really not a good fit for Git, right? So when, you think, when I was thinking about this, I realized that, well, Git is perfect for us. There's this whole thing lurking in the background behind these beautiful trees that we use, these big monolithic files. And that's what I'm interested in you know, bringing Git out so it can handle this kind of thing. So, just briefly, the, some of the problems with Git in large files, and I, I haven't looked at this lately. I think some of these things are improving gradually within Git, and that's wonderful because it makes it a little bit easier to just check your open office thing into Git anyway. But some of these are intractable. They're built into the design of Git. For example, you really need two times the disk space. You've got to have your Git, .git directory and your actual files, you know. Um, you can't, set, you can't partially check out a Git repository. Say you have, you know, 100 gigabytes of data, you only got a netbook with, you know, 60 gigs of storage. You can't just check out pieces and this and that that you need out of your repository. You need everything if you're using Git. That's the design. Um, and of course, you need everything that's ever been checked in the repository. Even if you deleted it, you know, five years ago, it's still there. And that's wonderful, but it's not so wonderful if it's an ISO image. 
And um, I, I was actually using Git for a while with large files, and I ran into this one in the middle. Auto repack can really suck if you have, say, 60 gigabytes in Git, and it happens to launch on some you know, embedded ARM machine that you're using to play your music files that you've checked into Git. Not fun. So I'm actually going to now go to my first little demo. I hope it'll look a little bit better than this, but I thought I'd put this up as the worst case scenario. Um, and I'm just going to start off. I've made two directories. Um, this one up here, I'm just going to use git for. So okay. we'll git init it. And they're both the same. They both have a 400 megabyte file in it, which, you know, it could be an ISO image. It could be a talk, say, something like that. Uh, let me git init down here, too, because we're we use git annex down here. So we'll also git annex init, which you need to do to tell git annex, hey, this is actually a repository that you can run in. So let's add the big file. OK, that's going to take a while, because it has to hash it and stuff. Now, I would love to say, oh, this is going to take just complete instantaneously. It's also hashing the file, and there's a good reason to do that. So you know, we'll pay the overhead. Um, if you actually wanted to, and you had enormous files, you could actually um, give it a flag that would tell it, check it in as is, just give me a dummy um, thing that isn't a checksum, and we can add one later. But as is, it does checksum. But OK, so that's done. Git's still running. What's it doing? Um, it's using 400 megabytes of memory, for one thing. <laughs> yeah. So while well, Git's still going, I think I'm going to make another repository. Oh, well, I shouldn't commit that, don't I? Okay, so let's make a clone. Um, you know, so that was nice and fast. Um, if you look here, you'll see what is a dangling sim link. Um, and the file isn't actually there, right? You know, we have a 260K repository for a 400 megabyte file. But if I wanted the file, if I could type, there. So um, what it's doing is it's figuring out how to get it, which is what the, you know, the recording state and get stuff is. And now it's copying the file over. Um, I don't hard link them just because of various reasons. But um, this could also be, of course, be a remote on a completely different computer. Ah, good. Git adds down. And we've already got another copy here. Um, so, so Git Annex tracks the location of this file, because it can't, it's not going to be in every single repository, so you have to know where it is. Um, so I can ask it, where's that file? And it knows that it's here, and it's in origin. I can also say, um, I can also say, well, why don't you move it from origin? Now it's only here. Um, you could also drop the file, which would remove it, but Git Annex knows, hey, that's the only copy you got of that file. You better not remove it. And you can also, um, how many copies shall I make it retain? Say three. So now if I wanted to drop it, it's like, well, no, you need three copies, actually. And if I wanted to say, I could say copy dash dash auto. And this would um, copy the file if it needs to, to attain the configured number of copies. So I can make another repository and run it again, and it would also copy. So that's the, you know, the five-minute overview of git annex command line. It's a set of git add-ons. It's fairly simple to use um, if you know how to use git. So how does it all work? Well, as we saw, there's a sim link in there. And I'm, I don't know about all of you. I am a little bit leery about programs that just go off and say, we're going to use a sim link because, gosh, it's a layer of indirection and it's fun. And uh, <laughs> I've seen some bad things. Um, but in this case, I think it actually works very well. Unfortunately, it's also the only possible way to do it. Uh, so what we have is a file. And the file here is actually checked into Git. The sim link is checked in. But the actual data over here, which is in Git Annex objects, hash for a hash of file, basically, is not checked into git at all. It's just living in your .git directory. So that's on your local computer. You can bar sync it around to other repositories. You know, anything that you can run SSH into, you can use as a git, as a git annex repository and put the file there. 
And uh, what this also allows for is you may want to store your enormous files somewhere that isn't a regular, you know, Linode machine or the machine in your basement or something. You might want to use actual cloud storage, for example. So you can store just the contents of the files, not the Git repository, which is tiny anyway, on what I call a special remote. And this basically uses, you know, it's a RESTful API. You only have to be able to put the file, get the file, delete the file, and check if it's there. And anything that has those four operations can basically be used as a special remote. So some of the ones that I've developed um, are these. Um, I'm not going to go through them all in detail. It's basically just things that were fairly easy to support and or cool. Um, some of the interesting ones, Amazon Glacier, of course, was fun because of their delay, but otherwise completely normal. Um, the web one is kind of fun because that actually lets you say, hey, this file out on, say, archive.org, which is, you know, a talk about something or whatever. I'd just like to pull that in and it'll remember, oh, I got it from this URL, so that'll be one of the locations that it tracks. Of course, the web could lose that file, so you generally tell it, don't trust things from the web being the only location that I'll keep of that file. And we have a hook system, so you can basically plug in any kind of special remote you want. So, we're storing this data out there on the cloud. How do we keep it secure? Right? And uh, I, what I did is I stole an encryption scheme from Obnam, which is a neat little backup program developed by Lars Rosenius. And um, so you have a symmetric encryption key, which isn't a GPG public key, it's just a, you know, random run-of-the-mill key used to encrypt the file. But what we do, whoa, there should be a symmetric key there. S excuse me. Anyway, um, we actually use a GPG key to encrypt the symmetric encryption key, which then is decrypted to, to encrypt the file. So what this allows you to do is have multiple GPG keys and add them as you like um, as you go around and you want to give access to this repository to other people um, without having to re-encrypt this file every time. So again, it's a little layer of indirection, but I think it's a useful, very useful little scheme and um, it's actually something that other things are trying to use. Um, if somebody knows of a name for this scheme that's in the literature or something, please let me know. Um, the other thing that I guess I should mention, especially in light of Josh's talk yesterday about, you know, using Git internals programmatically, is that uh, Git Annex actually has its own branch in the Git repository that it uses for all the data that it tracks about the repository. So um, the main thing that it's tracking is where all the files are, you know, out there in different places um, and different configuration. You can, it actually puts the uh, encrypted symmetric keys in that repository, which means that you don't have a key distribution problem beyond GPG key distribution. And I guess the neat thing about this branch is that you never get a conflict merging it. So whenever Git Annex pulls down a new version, or whenever Git does really, it's just Git pull, um, and it says, oh, there's another version from origin, it just automatically merges it in, in a conflict-free manner um, so that you, know, you can have multiple sources of data and they become eventually consistent. Um, so that's kind of the quick overview of Git Annex, and I thought I'd see if anybody has a question real quick. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You said that it merges in a uh, conflict-free manner. Right. Would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, basically, um, there's a concept in Git of something called a union merge which is basically just, you have two file, two versions of a file, file, you know, version A and version B, just take all the lines that are in either one and put them into version C. And so if you do that and then you have a timestamp to tell you which is the cur current version, and say you use vector clocks, which unfortunately I actually don't yet, but that is on the drawing board is to properly use vector clocks to avoid timestamp time stamp skew issues. Um, actually, it's not a big problem in practice because of the way um, timestamps happen to be used here, but anyway, you can say, okay, so I've got this big list of stuff, and I'll take the most recent piece of data, and there you are. Um, and then, of course, when it re if it ever goes to rewrite the file, it'll throw out the, you know, the old data, but you have it all stored in Git anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Any, anybody else? Okay. So, 
So I developed this, you know, a couple of years ago over the course of, a, you know, several years. Um, it took a lot longer than it would have taken if it were a little quick Perl script to write it in Haskell, but I ended up with something that I think is a lot better, a lot easier to extend, a lot more robust. And that was what let me move on to the second stage of this, which is the Git Annex Assistant. So what I want to do with this is make something that's, you know, not entirely unlike Dropbox. It's, um, I'm not, what I'm not trying to do is clone Dropbox in any way. And I haven't even actually used Dropbox. I have heard about it. Um, what, I wanted, what I wanted, though, is to bring, you know, the power of Git into something that everyday users could use. And I knew that I would need some time to do this, so I actually went out and asked for three months on Kickstarter of funding. And I actually got back uh, 12 months, which is great. Um, I think there might be a few people who back me in the room, thank you, or if you're on the video, thank you. Really wonderful to be able to do that. It was a big surprise that it took off to the extent it did. Um, so what I've developed as far as a UI is something that looks sort of like this. It's, uh, it's a web app because I didn't want to have to go off and do, you know, Mac OS X GUI development and uh, port it to Android and all that kind of thing. So uh, I think what I'm going to do is just uh, actually come out of here and actually give you a quick demo of that if I'm doing okay on time, which I think I am. Let's see, I believe it's under internet. Yeah. So we'll start it up from the menu. It just bounces over the web browser. And this is the first start screen. You can tell it where to put your repository. You can see that okay, can't you? Yeah, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's using uh, Twitter bootstrap, so I got all the big font prettiness. Um, so what can I do with this? Well, I can open up my file browser and see my file. Whoa. Except they're somewhere that I can't see them because my screen's too small. Ah, oh, there they are. Okay. Um, so I can see my files, but I don't have any yet. Um, why don't we put a file in here? I'll just save a copy of this into Annex. Okay. So it saved a copy of the presentation into the directory, and of course it's using iNotify. It immediately noticed it added the slides, added the lock file that OpenOffice, for some reason, drops in there and doesn't delete, uh, and committed it to Git. Simple. Something any user could probably use without having to know much about Git. So what else can we do with this? Well, we can go in and configure it. Actually, we can just go add another repository. Uh, this is a problem with giving a demo of something like this. I knew the first part would work, but I was pretty sure this part would eventually have a problem. And there it is. I've got some kind of, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's a browser bug or a uh, framework bug, but occasionally it does lock up like this and at the worst possible times. Okay, so let's go to configuration. Let's add a repository. We all got these uh, nice little drives at uh, from LCA, so I happen to have a USB key somewhere. There it is. Nice tiny little USB key. Is this thing still not working? This is like the, wow, that's bad. Maybe I need to try a different browser or something. I don't know if this Chromium thing's all that it's kicked up to be. Okay, come on. This is annoying. I've been chasing this bug for about two months and I can't reproduce it reliably enough except for apparently on in front of a room load of people <laughs> giving a talk to uh, debug if, whether it's at the, uh, you know, which layer it's even at. So maybe I can't give this demo. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and try uh, Ice Weasel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but what I was actually going to show you is that it's quite easy to just plug in a little USB device and uh, make a clone of the repository without having to know any Git commands. Did you have a question? Um, While well, my system's churning, apparently. Yeah, well, um, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's, it's something any user yeah. can use without knowing Git or whatever. Yeah. Is there any concept of multi-user or anything? So like okay. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you have something like this, um, that is, a, you know, it's sort of like Dropbox, but it doesn't have a central server. Multi-user is, sort of, I think, an interesting use case for it. Um, okay, here we go. Ah, what is that doing? I didn't even know that was running. That's not running. Okay. No. Sorry, folks, I'm going to give up on this demo and say it's still a work in progress. <laughs> um, what I wanted to show you is, you know, you can just plug in a USB key, and assuming that the thing is actually responding at the time, it will, you know, say, okay, would you like to clone my repository into this? And as soon as you set that up, it will begin syncing to it. Um, what I wasn't going to show you, because I don't trust the network here, of course, is that uh, you can also go out and add, you know, other repositories out there on the web or on the net, I should say, and uh, it'll sync to those in a manner sort of like Dropbox. So um, I should probably talk about how this syncing works because it was one of the trickier challenges of this whole thing. So, you know, if I've got it here in my laptop, I want it over there. It's wonderful if we just have an end-to-end -end net, but, you know, as we've all heard in depressing talk, a depressing talk here a couple of days ago, this is a fairly unlikely scenario on today's internet. You've probably got this scenario, right, where you've got a company in the middle, your laptop can't talk to your machine at work or at home, you've got whatever up there. Um, what I actually support is multiple companies, which I think is, you know, baseline for this kind of thing if you're, you can't just support one. And um, what the laptop is sending over to the server is only the contents of the files. It's not actually sending the Git repository around through, say, GitHub or something. So you can, you know, you can pick whatever company you like, and as far as the metadata, we need a way to get that to work. And again, my freaking pictures aren't working, which is very annoying. Whoa, that's special. So what is supposed to be in between there is XMMPP, XMPP. Um, what I've developed is a way to do a git push you, um, and tunneled it through XMPP because it's a protocol that's quite easy for average user who has a Google account to go log into. And so when this laptop wants to tell the server, hey, he's just added this file, all it has to do is, um, you know, start an XMPP session and start tunneling data through it. Luckily, Git repositories aren't that big if you're just sending a few files that have changed that happen to be symlinks. So even though it's all base64 encoded inside the packet, it works great. It actually looks like this when you're pushing. Um, you know, it's kind of a special URL and otherwise just like a regular Git connection push. So, um, I guess another thing that I've been working on lately is, like I said, it uses symlinks. But this does suck. <laughs> um, so I've actually been working recently on giving the user, at least the user of the Git Annex Assistant, an interface where they actually just have regular files and not symlinks. And the way I'm doing that is by um, basically bypassing a lot of Git stuff because, you know, if they're using something like this, they probably don't care about being able to run Git rebase on their repository or something. So they just have a directory full of files. It actually checks in the symlinks behind their back and it's passed around in Git repositories that way. But as far as they're concerned, they can just go and edit a file directly and it's just a regular file. And um, something that's actually come up during the conference here is um, a guy on the uh, IRC channel that we hang out on for Git Annex came up with this awesome encrypted Git system, which lets you have a Git remote out there on, say, GitHub or any, really any place that you could store Git data, and it's encrypted with GPG before it actually leaves your machine. Really cool, hoping to integrate that in because I think it's kind of the missing, a missing piece in the puzzle um, because we really do want to have everything encrypt it as it goes over the wire because this could be used for any kind of confidential data or whatever. So I guess I'll end up here. Um, I was recently uh, contacted by this group of Taiko artists in LA. Um, it's a Japanese drumming thing. And they're apparently, you know, they've got this big community going on where they record their drum riffs and they pass them around between each other. And, you know, they build on them, they extend them. It sounds a lot like the free software community, except it's all about beating on things with sticks. <laughs> exactly like the free software community, yeah. 
And so, you know, these guys actually contact me and they say, this looks like it might be something we could use rather than just relying on YouTube or whatever and actually have a repository of all our drum data and give it to our students and share it as we, you know, as we meet each other at conferences, just pass some thumb drives around and get the newest stuff and all that kind of thing. So that's the kind of direction that I'm hoping to head in. I really want to have it usable by regular users. I want to escape, you know, the shackles. If you want to have Dropbox, you're just sharing it with somebody you trust with your password, which is insane. Um, I assume that's true. I could be completely wrong. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I want to have something that's, could, that's theoretically peer-to-peer, -peer, that's well distributed, that allows for local archival, that allows for offline use, and hopefully we'll get there. We'll see. So, do I have any questions? I don't know how I'm doing on time. Okay. Lots. So, given that you use Haskell for this, I've got to ask, lazy I.O., enumerity, iterity, conduits, or pipes? <sighs> I'm waiting for it to settle out, but I am using Assad, so I'm using conduits underneath in some places, but mostly it's just lazy I.O. and caution. Hi, Joey. Um, I'm a fan of, of pretty much every piece of software you've ever written. Oh, you. So, my question is, um, once you're done with Git Annex Assistant, will there be anything any other project that uh, we'll be able to fund? <laughs> Gosh, that's a hard question. <laughs> we'll have to come back to that one later. So um, the main problem I've got, like, uh, with Git and binary files is, of course, like, you've got a big binary file. You, say, tweak a little bit of it, and now you've got two big binary files that are almost identical and yet taking right. up right. the a, a amount of space, and when you do a git clone, of course, on a, a client, and a, yeah, my clients are on little yep. ARM machines, now they're trying to pull down big binary data. I was wondering, like, you didn't cover so much about what happens with small changes to big binary files? Yeah, because that's really probably my weak spot right now. I, um, I assume A, disk space is cheap, and uh, B, you've probably got some bandwidth, but this is a weak spot, and I think it's probably going to start by uh, trying to, you know, use delta deltas uh, between recent versions of the file or something like that as we transfer over the network. Unfortunately, when you're sending something to S3, you really don't have that option unless you're just sending the delta. And so there's obviously protocol work to be done here. It's, um, it's something that I was hoping to, you know, get away with for now. But for certain use cases, it's clearly essential. If you have really big data, you're, you need it. And uh, there's obviously lots of uh, uh, watch it work now. Uh, <laughs> so actually, I guess if we have a little bit more time, which I assume we do, because I blew this part of the demo, I could show you a few things. I, I don't want to go through anything that actually hits the network, because I haven't tried to make it work well, and I don't want to type in passwords anyway, but I can't show you, you know, the level of uh, configuration that a user is going to need. It's a few fields, but, you know, they're mostly pretty self-explanatory, right? Um, and yeah, we support pretty much everything that's linked here. The phone thing is, you know, future work. Network attached storage is future work. Um, th some of these are kind of cool. This one is uh, just local pairing on the network. And if somebody actually had GitAnx running, like the assistant right now, and I typed in LCA 20 2013, then it, it's going to go out and, you know, do some broadcasting and try to find a machine that knows that secret and just pair with it. And if it actually does that, what it'll do is set up a, a restricted SSH key, so all you can ever do is push git stuff around between the two machines, and then it'll become a remote. So you can have local sharing, which Dropbox, of course, does. Um, so that's kind of a cool little feature. Um, this one's if you just need a, uh, you know, your server up on the net, that's the one I would use, of course. And then I was going to show you the removable drive one, because I can, whoop, if I got this, US, this little tiny USB card turned around the right way. Let's see. Ah, still demo fail. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is, I think, a regular user could use, although it does need to switch to using... Uh, or some kind of polling to figure out when that drive's hooked up. Um, the neat thing about this is 
what I wanted to show you is you actually have these repository groups. And this is slightly confusing, but very powerful, so I put it in any way. Um, the neat thing about transfer is I have this little USB drive. It's got, what, eight, eight gigs of storage, I think? Yeah. So you're obviously not going to sync all your files to a little tiny USB drive. But what you can do is sync all the files that it thinks, well, if this, is, if this USB drive is plugged into another repository that I know, what is it going to want? And so it can figure that out based on the location tracking that it has and just put the right files on it. Although it also speculatively copies new files onto it, even though there's no other repository right now. And so I think we've actually already uploaded, as you can see over here, it's already synced the files to the USB drive while we were sitting here. And if I add a new file, it'll do it right immediately. Um, there's uh, several other interesting options here. You can also, there's also a whole, um, a whole DSL that you can use to configure this if you're more programmatically inclined. Um, I think that's really all I wanted to demo in here. And uh, so I guess we'll get back to questions now. Sorry, yeah, you said um, it's really great that people can use this and don't really have to worry about Git. How much do they have to worry about GPG? Good question. So. Well, Ginax can use GPG, and I would highly encourage that you use GPG. It can also just encrypt things with that symmetric key that I showed you. And in that case, anybody who gets a hold of a copy of your Git repository can decrypt all your files from wherever they are. And as long as you're okay with that, you don't have a key distribution problem, which I can't solve any better than anybody else can. And so that's what this thing sets up by default. Um, I would like to try to add something to exchange GPG keys, maybe some kind of a pairing mechanism over the local network or something. Um, open ideas here. But it's a hard problem, right? <laughs> Who's next? Um, over here. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your Kickstarter experience? What was the good points? What was the bad yeah. points? And what do you attribute your success to? Well, I guess starting with why did it sort of take off, although not you know, this wasn't like a large-scale Kickstarter takeoff. This was, I can live frugally for a year takeoff, right? Um, I had already spent two years developing the program. Let's start with that. So, you know, I think I had people who trusted that I could actually make something that they could use, and maybe they were like, well, maybe my mom can use this other thing if he actually manages to make something that doesn't lock up in the middle of presentations. Um, the Kickstarter experience, it's, it's, it's elating. Um, the UI is horrible. They have five different flavors of Markdown-ish stuff, all different, all in UI. I can't believe it. Uh, they're very unclear about whether this is a free software project, and there was massive user confusion, even though I said right on the front page, this will be AGPL'd and GPL'd. <laughs> um, it's, I was surprised at how good my uh, contributors have been about not being backseat drivers. I, I have the internet as a boss right now, but it's actually been a pretty good boss, which is amazing. <laughs> um, what else can I say? Um, I think it's important to have a good video, duh. <laughs> but I put my video together in three days and it involved stick figure drawings, so it doesn't take that much. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, I was just wondering uh, what framework you're using for the web interface. Okay. Um, this is, as I said, Twitter Bootstrap. So it gives us all this fairly pretty gooey looking stuff. Um, I'm using underneath that jQuery. Um, I have 100 lines of JavaScript that I wrote myself. And all they do is make uh, this long polling stuff that isn't working right now work. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's. Fairly, everything else is just HTML, and I could make a form in about a minute. On the Haskell side, it is the Assad web framework, which is a crazy type safe web framework for Haskell. Um, it's been a lot of fun to use. And, um, yeah. So you said that you uh, did it as a web uh, app because you don't want to port onto various mobile devices. Yeah. Um, I think part of the success story of Dropbox is that it is on all these mobile devices. And um, I'm just wondering well, what, uh, what, what the pathway would be to get there. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm using Twitter Bootstrap. So one of, the, one of the cool things that I love about Bootstrap is it's got this responsive UI. 
when I make my screen narrow, it's already starting to look a little bit like it could fit on a cell phone, right? And um, I don't know what the portability story to, say, Android is going to look like, because actually nobody has ever ported Haskell to Android yet. So that's going to be fun. I'm doing that next month, apparently. <laughs> I noticed you had a lot of um, videos on archive.org and things like that bookmarked. Have you had any interest from the people doing Miro? Doing what? Miro. Miro. It's Is a that the, uh, sort of universal media browser. Oh, that. Um, no, I haven't heard from them. Um, I ha there are a few pro there's a photo. There's a project called Open Photo, which was actually kickstarted a while ago, and actually I stole their stick figure drawings and used their idea, and uh, now they're making a good annex back end with PhD students in France, which is kind of cool. Um, but no, I haven't heard from Miro. The, uh, the work that you're doing to uh, move away from sim links in certain cases, uh, will that be, um, will it be possible through, through that to use, to say, have a remote that's um, like a, a fat file system and, oh. and use, have real files on there? In theory, because um, I would like to support Windows because a certain percentage, around 10% of my users say they would use it, and I assume that I'm biased heavily toward geeks right now. Um, so yeah, it's theoretically possible to use it that way. It's a fairly small tweak to just remove a few places that still write sim links. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So if I put this thing in direct mode, this isn't a sim link anymore. It's just a regular file. Um, the interesting thing about this is if I write to the file, I'm losing the only copy I've got because it was only in one place. So the direct mode, you know, you're flying without Git's, you know, parachute. Um, if I move that back to origin, it's back to a dangling symbolink because there's nothing, no other way to represent a file that isn't there that I can think of, and it's better to be able to move your files around even if they're not there. Um, actually, this is one of the ways that I use this thing is I have a whole pile of offline storage and stuff, and I can go reorganize it and look through it without ever mounting the drive. And then if I want to look at a specific file that I looked at last five years ago, I know exactly where to go, and assuming that drive still spins up, I've got it. <laughs> Um, slightly more technical question. Um, I've got some reasonably large sets of files that are being copied around via rsync um, with a moderately low bandwidth link between them. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to put those files into Git Annex without having to copy them all yep. from point A to point B Absolutely. again? Absolutely. That's why we do the checksumming. If you have two repositories and they both have the same file in them, you can just git init on both sides and then git, add on, git annex add on both sides and it'll give you the same key. So at that point, you've got files on both ends of your link that are the same, and it, we won't need to transfer them around. Um, we also do it, of course, so we can do things like you know, fisking the repository, making sure your data is still there, and that kind of thing. But that's a good use case, also one that I use. All right. Thank you. Yep. Are there any, are there any further questions? What a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much, Joey.